Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Professor at the Boston University, how did that happen? Uh, well, I, I was doing my PhD in University of California, San Diego, and I met somebody at BU, uh, at, from Boston University, uh, who mentioned that they will be growing their computer engineering program. So I looked into it, I visited Boston, I liked the school, I liked the city, and I applied. So I was, um, I guess since an early age, uh, from high school I was interested in physics, maths, um, and then I wanted to do engineering in college, uh, so I went to a um, I, I went to study microelectronics engineering uh, that was back in Turkey and um, it was a very um, a good program, very competitive, very hands-on, uh, lots of projects, lots of building. Um, I was actually doing uh, work more closer to circuit design um, back then and then um, I just liked it a lot. I loved it. I wanted to continue uh, doing it uh, but with more research aspects so I decided to go into a PhD program and I mostly applied to places with uh, either circuit design or embedded design um, type of programs and during my PhD I got interested in energy related problems, temperature awareness of systems, energy efficiency and embedded systems uh, have a lot of uh, interesting topics along those lines. You're, you're still doing hands-on electronics yourself? Uh, to some extent. I mean, of course, time-wise, it's uh, harder now, but I teach embedded systems course every year. And over there, uh, there's there are a ch chunk of uh, very hands-on system design projects. Uh, so students use boards, uh, development boards, and write kernel modules, and integrate sensors and actuators. So I designed those labs and uh, so I have a lot of research topics that I'm actively working on from uh, mobile system efficiency all the way to large-scale large, large scale systems and cloud. Uh, but something that's common, I would say, in all of my projects is at one point or another, even if we start off with a simulator-based uh, experimentation, at some point we do some real system prototyping. It could be on a board, it could be we develop a prototype to validate something, it could be implementing something in a large scale cluster, but we have for each project, I like that aspect, I just yeah. really like it. It also increases credibility to go in, credibility for our own sake, but also to present it to the outside world. Yeah. It makes a difference when we are able to say we did this and it worked. Can I just bring the conversation to one of your research areas, which I, I think I found it very interesting, which was 3D chip design. Yes. Now, I, I did some research on this, and I must admit that a lot of the information I found on the internet was actually quite dated. It goes back to 2012, 2013. Is 3D chip design, is that still happening? Is that a subject which is happening right now? or? It is actually, uh, it is happening and it's going to happen more. I mean, the research for 3D, you are right that it's it's not new. It's been around for some time now. Um, the f very first paper I think I wrote, I mean, my first paper on the topic was 2008 or 9. Uh, so I've been working on the topic for a while myself. Um, uh, but it is going to be there because the... Um, Technology scaling is coming to um, a hard limitation. I mean, we are already at uh, 22 nanometers, and a few companies are going to pursue uh, technology scaling beyond that. What does that mean? Well, to increase functionality and to increase the trend of doing more efficient computing for each chip generation, we need to find another way to put things into a chip. Yeah, because so there are some yeah. research that's around new materials, carbon nanotubes, um, other types of materials, spintronics, and so there are many other device uh, level uh, re research efforts. Uh, but in terms of integration, 3D uh, also enables this. So you can actually have multiple chips. Um, st because because if, if I may interrupt you, because not, not a lot of people will perhaps be familiar with. 3D uh, yes. chip design. But so basically in 3D, the idea is to build multiple chips, potentially with different technologies. Uh, you can have the same technology repeated, but you can also have a processor with DRAM or maybe a sensory layer or maybe an optical interconnect layer. So you can have different chips. 
and then you stack them, you basically build like an apartment building. You put different floors on top of each other, and um, all of these layers are then connected with uh, what we call through silicon vias that are actually vertical interconnects that go through. So this is 3D is still um, out there, and actually for the uh, when you read projection of where computer architecture is going, uh, 3D is going to enable a lot of the future technologies because uh, even when you use new devices, so let's say you are able to do a carbon nanotube processor uh, instead of CMOS. So are you going to be able to build everything with that or are you going to have your carbon nanotube processor potentially with uh, some DRAM integrated via okay. 3D yeah. stacking? Yeah. Similarly, you might have uh, different types of uh, processors uh, built with different technologies. Maybe perhaps you have an interesting technology, but it's hard to scale it beyond 22 nanometers. And then you have some accelerator that was built with another technology. You can build them separately. And then, of course, thinking about 3D stacking during the design stage, you can't just design and yeah, think yeah, yeah, about yeah, it yeah. later. But uh, you can enable all um, these type of things with 3D. I think there are companies, of course, busy with this technology, but is there already um, a, a working sample of a 3D chip design which is available in the market currently? Uh, so when you look at memories, uh, there are memories. Uh, Micron has 3D stack memories, so it's, okay. there are no processor components, but uh, DRAM chips stacked on top of each other. Uh, so that's been around for some time. And uh, there are 2.5D examples instead of 3D. Okay, okay. So in 3D, we have all active chips that are stacked on top of each other. In 2.5D, instead of stacking active chips on top of each other, you create a passive interposer um, that doesn't have much active component. And on top of that, you stack chips. Okay. So it's okay. just, it's a two story building. Yeah. And one of the stories is. Um, uh, one of the levels is kind of uh, less complex, it's larger, it's less complex to build, so on top of it you put your 3D and this interposer enables fast high bandwidth interconnects uh, to connect these different chips. So yeah. this is, a, a Xilinx uh, did FPGAs with 2.5D, uh, yeah. so essentially the, to, their purpose was to uh, build a larger FPGA because there are challenges with building a very large chip. As the chip area becomes larger, uh, the manufacturing process is imperfect and there are faults. Yeah. So if you build something very large, you can you the yield drops essentially. And so yeah. that increases yeah. the chip cost. So Xilinx did it. So they built multiple FPGAs, connected them on 2.5D. And AMD, a couple of years ago, um, put uh, a product on the market that has a GPU uh, and a 3D a stacked hybrid memory cube. Uh, I'm sorry, a high bandwidth memory cube and a GPU stacked uh, via and uh, connected via 2.5D uh, okay. stack. 2.5D provides a lot of companies to be able to do this faster and I think there's a lot of growth and uh, interest right now in um, 2.5D design. Essentially, some uh, people call it chiplet-based design. Instead of making one big chip, you make little chiplets and put them on a 2.5D interposer. So that's, um, to some extent, 3D stacking. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see more of it. DARPA has programs. Industry has more interest in it uh, these days because everybody wants to look into building larger and heterogeneous and more aggressive systems. It, it brings me to another subject, which is also one of your topics, which is green electronics, green technology. Now that sounds very nice. Green technology. Is there? What, what is your definition of green technology? Is is there green technology, or is <laughs> By definition, well, all yeah. technology black and dark. <laughs> <laughs> well, green computing is a buzzword, um, and I'm I'm actually not a big fan of buzzwords, but it's interesting and it takes people's attention. So, green computing refers to um, it. It could be from small scale systems all the way to large scale systems, but the idea is to have computers minimize their energy consumption. There is a lot of flexibility that comes with computing, uh, so there are many things you can do to reduce your energy consumption. Yes. So I like that flexibility in computing. You can compute using a different algorithm. You can change your hardware. You can change the operating system scheduler. You can change or include more power management methods. You can change how you're managing your temperature 
which also affects your overall energy efficiency. So mm. there are so many things you can control. I teach an embedded systems course uh, over there. There are multiple lectures um, that cover efficiency, power, power and temperature relationship. And students learn, for example, you can write the same application using a different environment, using a different algorithm. You can optimize it in a different way or you can change your system software and the resulting efficiency of your system is going to be different. Especially when you combine this with the awareness that you are not always necessarily trying to maximize your performance. Sometimes you might be better off when you meet your deadlines. Uh, let's mm -hmm. say you are writing an image processing application and you are fine if you can process 30 frames per second. Let's say that's your constraint that you want to meet. As long as you meet that, perhaps you can write your um, code in a different way or optimize your system in a different way to reduce your power consumption. That could give you more battery power, more quality of service delivered yeah. to the user. Yeah, so see. students learn about these concepts and they can get more hands-on experience. There are other courses um, at Boston University, and I know at other institutions as well, that highlight this aspect. Okay. Uh, so that students uh, understand it's not just, okay, I got an idea, let me just put in the first hardware design or the first set of code that, I, that comes to my mind, but instead take a step back and think about what are my constraints, will this work yeah. when, I, uh, when I actually uh, put it into a, um, a prototype, will this work in the sense that will it meet its uh, user constraints in terms yeah. of power efficiency, cost, uh, real-time deadlines and the like. It's, it's, it's interesting to hear that, you know, you, you actually describe that thermal issues can be uh, having uh, an effect both through hardware design but also through the software. Okay, thank you. well, this thank you very me. much. Thank you very much for your time and have a good Thank day. you. Thank you.